Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope that you each got nourished uh, biologically as well as I hope you did intellectually this morning, this morning in, in the Americas. Uh, so this is our final session. We're going to go for uh, two hours and we're really fortunate uh, to have as our final speaker, Hannah Dieger, who as you've heard from some of our other speakers has been making some uh, really signal contributions to uh, the, the broader topic that we're addressing in this entire symposium. Uh, following that, uh, we've asked Evan to uh, make some specific comments about Hannah's talk, and then we're going to transition into a full panel discussion. And then Roshi and, and Amy are going to make some closing remarks. So Hannah, over to you. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me. And. Um... Uh, I well, I will share my screen and then um, begin the right share. Now you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, we see it fine. Great. So um, I've been drinking up what other people have been saying in the seminar uh, in the symposium so far, and. Um, what I will try to do is to connect um, to the things that I understand of what have been going on uh, in the seminar so far, um, and to do that from my work on participatory sense making and loving and knowing, and to deepen those a little bit and to connect to especially the, the, the thread of indigenous epistemologies, and also um, the thread, I think, of grief and of um, opening up connection through that. Um, but it's in a way, I, I took up what, what Roshi Jones said at the end of last session, that we, we can push questions here and I'm going to do that. So I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit and uh, try to do that. And we will see how that goes because yeah, I'm out on a limb and also this is the time and normally I would be in bed or well on my way to bed. So that might bring some kind of relaxation in trying out something like this, but it also brings a specific kind of nervousness, but that's fine. So to begin with, um, I have a question and I don't really understand the question myself yet, and I'm, but I'm going to say some things about it anyway. So, and this question comes on the basis of Evan's first presentation and on, on, on what has been happening in this symposium so far. So the question is, and I, I really would like everybody in the audience to, to, to feel that in relation to me as a speaker as well, because we are doing something interactive, intersubjective here, even though it's at, at such a distance. It's a wide question. Um, in, it's a general question, a philosophical question, I think, but it's also something that might happen between us. So. Does time open up between us? Um, I will come back to the question at the end of the presentation as well. Um, but so I want to say something about it at first. Um, I've been working on the connection between indigenous epistemologies and an active cognitive science for a few years now. I've sensed this connection for a while. Um, and I've begun explicitly touching on it in uh, writing in my Loving and Knowing paper, which is on the resources pages. Um, and Evan's abstract and presentation yesterday were very inspiring to me. And I would like to take up the same topic or a similar topic um, and deepen some of the points that are very much in line with what Evan has said in my own way. Um, even though I won't talk about hope specifically, but all the other aspects, yes. So by coincidence, I could attend a talk of Kyle White um, a little bit more than a week ago, uh, one of the main uh, people that um, Evan referred to in his presentation. And this presentation by, by Kyle White, an indigenous philosopher, was very rich and inspiring. And there, I think there are indeed some things that we can say and do from an inactive perspective that can be insightful, I think, in relation to the, the question of climate change and the urgency or not of that issue. Um, I think that the questions are indeed of epistemology, so of what we can know, 
um, understanding knowing, and they are questions also of ethics, which is what we can do, or what, how and what to practice. And they are all, also questions of ontology. And this is about understanding being and connecting with being. So I would like to see if I can open up time intersubjectively to touch on all these questions. And I think what we do when we connect with each other actually is open up time and space between us so that we can have increased capacities for dealing with all kinds of different situations, including difficult situations. So what do I mean when I say opening up time intersubjectively? I think Kyle White is right to warn against crisis epistemologies and the urgency that comes with them, as he does in his 2020 chapter in the uh, handbook on, on um, it's called Radical Indigenous uh, Studies, I think. Um, so settler colonial societies are suddenly under the influence of an idea that we need to now urgently do something against this problem of climate change. But First Nations, Indigenous people, on the other hand, at, at least the ones that Kyle White talks about in, in, uh, in the US, they are not so much ready to move quickly to do something about this and to throw all kinds of really still continually destructive science and technology against what's happening. So as Kyle White said in his presentation, the approach of the First Nations people that he talks about and that he's also a member of or a part of, um, their approach is more one of waiting it out and, and getting past this period in history where our global, it seems, ways of knowing and our practices, ethical and scientific and societal practices, are dominated by a colonial, disruptive, divisive and alienated ways of doing things. Indigenous epistemologies are not there for the take up, as some people worried about climate change might seem to wish to help the world deal with this climate change. These epistemologies are wholly different ways of knowing and of engaging, and it behooves us, scientists, colonial scientists, policymakers, and worried people to make careful connection with them. And this notion of careful connection is important to keep in mind to, during the presentation. Careful connection is important. Rather than to try and usurp and extract indigenous epistemologies and what they might have to say for what might quite likely be misguided purposes, as Kyle White warns. And there are a few issues at play here. Um, the first one is time and different conceptions of time. Uh, according to Kyle White, so the urgency on the part of colonial uh, ways of doing things versus kinship time and depth time in indigenous epistemologies. Another issue at play is intersubjectivity, so the role of micro interactions between people where distrust and harm are in, run incredibly deep in, in relations between First Nations people and um, uh, US government and Canadian government, for instance. But in these micro interactions, time can also open up and begin to admit of a different way of engaging, I think. And I asked Kyle White about this in his presentation, and I think he seemed to agree, even though it was a very quick exchange and we would need to say more about it. But I think intersubjectivity is at play here as well. And then a third issue that is at play here is what Western or colonial science needs to be to, be, to admit of a different ground, to be able to begin making a careful connection with indigenous epistemologies. Um, I think we need to have a proper ground in, uh, or in uh, cognitive science, Western cognitive science, in order to begin making this dialogue. And I think with an active cognitive science, we have elements in hand to do that. And this has also been recognized by uh, people like Joe Kincello, who wrote about this already uh, quite some years ago and made a connection explicitly with Francisco Varela's work around these topics as well in what he calls critical ontology and his work on education. So to begin with my second point that is at issue here, namely intersubjectivity, 
Kyle White is also a conflict medi mediator and facilitator of conversations between First Nations and the US government. And in that capacity, he says, you, you can't just, he, this is a quote from his presentation, you can't just say that you want to fix it. You have to deal with relationships. And these relationships are, rela are, are steeped in deep and extended history of harms, full of distrust, full of lack of consent, and so on, and full of lack of respect and all those things, as we know very well. But these relationships play out in micro interactions, that is, in the actual interpersonal interactions uh, through which these conversations go. They play out on different levels, but also in micro interactions. And these are interactions in which, for First Nations people, their consent hasn't mattered so far, or not enough at least, and in which there is a lack of trust, and in which the same harms keep being perpet perpetuated. Um, I need to know more about this. I haven't studied it quite enough yet, and I will be going to Vancouver next year for a year to, um, and this is one of my goals to study this actually, or to, to make a connection with this, a careful connection, I will try. Um, so White also talks about different understandings of time, this linear, fast, superficial kind of time understanding of colonial ways, which is um, yeah, linear and fast and, and um, yeah, uh, quite divisive in a way, versus the depth and what he calls depth and immemorial time of First Nations epistemologies. I think with what we know from the inactive approach to intersubjectivity, both conceptually and experientially, that, uh, and about participatory sense-making, that micro-interactions might be places where something can be done, and that this, is some, that this something has a chance there in these interactions to make a difference. And I think that micro-interactions are one place where we can do a kind of guerrilla approach to making things better to fight climate change, but also to make the situations of First Nations people better without just foregoing them in our urgency to do something about the situation. And this is not following Kyle White to solve climate change by urgent technological extractive and appropriative solutions that remain divisive and that perpetuate harms. And it might also not be exactly the way First Nations would have it if they were able to be left to their own devices. Rather, what will happen, what will emerge, will be something that we cannot foresee. And this is needed, I think. It is needed that we cannot quite foresee what it will look like. This is needed because we need a true openness for it, but an openness without forgetting or doing away with the past. An openness rather also to the past and to genuine understandings of the past, that is engagements with its full, also problematic manifestations. And only then I think we can build change. And here's where the notion of loving and knowing comes in that I've been developing over, over the past years. And I'll try to explain this now and go into the inactive approach to intersubjectivity um, and uh, yeah, explain that and then come back to this question of, of time opening up and indigenous knowing. Um, so the question in loving and knowing that I've been asking is what, of, what are really our most sophisticated forms of knowing? Is it computational knowing? Well, with the inactive approach, we have been criticizing this for a long time, quite clearly. Uh, that's not our most sophisticated way of knowing. We, but, and I want to illustrate it quickly with an example from uh, dementia research and dementia interactions. So when, um, Traditional psychology tends to um, think about something like dementia as a problem of cognition, and it proposes tests like, can people with dementia still categorize emotions? And it finds that they are less and less able to do so, and from that follows a kind of idea that they are not emotionally capable anymore, which quickly leads to what um, I, I've just recently found out that um, in a, in, um, a dementia activist, the person who lives with dementia herself, but also is an act, is, and also is an activist, calls this prescribed disengagement, because this kind of view of traditional cognitive science of people 
not being able to categorize emotions and then not having emotional capacities is actually almost a prescription that we cannot engage with, with people with dementia anymore. And that's dangerous. And, and I, I think in actual relations with people with dementia. And also the, the experience, the lived experience of dementia is not like that and we shouldn't let it be like that. We, when you know a person with dementia closely, there is an emotional connection that keeps being there and that we have to be careful to maintain and be attentive to and um, remain in contact with each other through a kind of um, loving and knowing connection, if you like. And a paper appeared very recently, a month ago almost, um, which illustrates this very nicely. There are there's other work on this as well by, for instance, Christine Seiler and Pia Contos and other people who have described this very carefully. But this recent work is about, um, um, it's done by a dancer and ethnographer, Kevin Lee, um, a PhD researcher at McGill University who developed some a method that he called moving with where he um, applies his dance and ethno ethnography to moving with people with dementia and their primary caregivers and doing this over a series of, of uh, interactions with them um, over weeks um, and he found there that you can keep care fully alive by moving with each other and giving space for moving with each other and thereby opening capacity and people to meet each other carefully in connection. Um, and he connects this also to uh, um, Dewey's work, John Dewey's work on, um, on aesthetics and experience. It's a very careful piece of work and I really recommend it on this topic. Um, another issue is, uh, yeah, as I said already, we, we, we are touching on, on First Nations land rights, treaties and negotiations in which um, the ways of knowing and the, the kinds of the, the, these treaties and negotiations happen on the basis of, of legalese and, and governmentalese, to, to say it very quickly, without taking into account the ways of knowing that First Nations bring to the table. They aren't actually even at the table, these ways of knowing, because they are um, not recognized, the, the land-based uh, uh, epistemologies and, and the careful embodied um, connections to ancestors are just not seen as ways of knowing in these kinds of interactions. And this, where, whereas I would say they are also very sophisticated ways of knowing. And I, I first became aware of this when a political scientist who is now working at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay in Canada um, um, talked to me about his PhD research where he said that um, uh, you could understand First Nations knowing through the lens of participatory sense making and try to make um, conversations happen in which all these different ways of knowing, knowing could come to the table and be able to speak with each other. I think we're still far from that, but um, people are picking that up in this way. And I think that's very interesting and, and promising. So there are all kinds of sophisticated ways of human knowing that we haven't really seen in cognitive science enough. Um, but the inactive approach to cognitive science, as we all know here, has, has definitely made big strides in recognizing these ways of knowing. Um, and so particularly in, in the, the theory of participatory sense-making, I think this comes to bear. And of course, Evan already mentioned it, um, and so did Amy. Um, in participatory sense making, what happens is that sense makers meet, and sense makers are self organizing uh, people who are, or, or individuals, also animals do this, um, who self organize, and from that, for, from that concern that comes with that, interact with the world in terms of their needs and constraints and their adaptivity, and so on. And when sense makers meet, and they're always moving bodies. When they meet, their movements can begin to coordinate. And because we are embodied, moving, self-organizing creatures, and when we meet and coordinate our movements, which we do at all kinds of levels, below awareness, um, but also uh, we, we do this also in, in aware ways, um, this 
coordination of our movements means that our sense makings also can become coordinated or we can literally participate in, e in each other's sense makings, um, which is not something that's always fluid or, or fluent. It's, it often involves breakdowns uh, in, in coordination on all kinds of different levels. Um, and that's been described in, in a lot of detail in many different papers. Um, so we consider uh, social cognition or, or what, what is in, cognitive, in traditional cognitive science very, in a very limited way called social cognition, but actually this is about our whole rich intersubjective lives. What happens is that interaction processes also emerge between people and can influence and co-determine their intentions. So it's not just an individual interacting with another, but also something emerges between them to which they also have to relate and which determines how they can participate. And so intersubjectivity is understood as this interplay between interactive and individual autonomies. And this is very briefly the theory of participatory sense making. Um, um, we, in the book Linguistic Bodies, we also work this out uh, towards language, towards the theory of language. Um, it's, a, it's a very full book, uh, quite dense actually, having written it, looking back at it afterwards, it's, it's quite a dense book. So, um, but here are some quick slogans from the book. Um, we are all different bodies. Everybody is a different body. We, we also have, uh, uh, one person has different bodies. They're organic, sensory and sensory motor and social bodies. And in all these bodies or through all these bodies, we maintain ourselves, we maintain identities in interaction with the world. We are autonomous and adaptive and, and also heteronomously uh, engaging with the world. So we are in the, in the world, there are literally billions of different bodies and everybody is different, not just the others, but I'm different too, which is something um, that I, I will mention again later. Um, and we understand language, uh, going back to the work of Bakhtin, as a living stream in which we participate and we participate in weaving threads of meaning. Um, so this means that when we speak, when I speak now, I speak as an inactive cognitive scientist. So I have all the threads of meaning that came before and that are happening alongside what I'm saying. And I speak in those ways. I, so I, con I contribute to weaving these threads of meaning and we all do. And there are threads of meaning in this symposium, which I haven't been able to participate in so much. And these are the, the Buddhist ones because I'm, I'm not a student of that. I'm not an expert. And so, those are weaves of threads of meaning that are for me personally harder to connect to as an expert or, or in some kind of expertise. And this is kind of to explain the, these, um, or to give a sense of what, what these threads of meaning are that we participate in. Um, we incorporate and incarnate ways of speaking, notions and so on. That means that we also struggle with them. Uh, we might not always want to speak in certain ways, but they might come to us anyway, and we might need to fight with them. Um, I'm not doing this full justice, but I'm also aware of time, so I'm going a little bit quickly through this. But another important takeaway message from this um, approach to language is that we are always fully participants in a linguistic uh, world, even infants who don't speak yet. Um, are full participants in that they are fully taken up in language. They, um, they are already engaged even before being born in rhythms of the language being sp spoken around them. Um, and so they're always fully participating at their level of capacity. And a person, an adult person who writes poetry, for instance, is also a full participant. And we are used to thinking of that as a much higher capacity, but actually, everyone is always a full participant in their capacity. Um, and we say something at the very end of the book also, um, this kind of approach, as we also know from, from Francisco Varela's work and from the work of all of us here who've been speaking that an active cognitive science comes 
with and is aware of its responsibility in the concepts that it's deve it develops. It's this interplay between experience and developing concepts and the circula circulation between them that comes with responsibility. And if we want to take one ethical maxim, if there is one, from this book um, or from, from this approach to language, it would be that whatever is the case, we should always invite and support participation. Um, and I will give an example also in a moment of that uh, to explain that a little bit more. But I still think that um, on the one hand, participatory sense making could do with some deepening um, because it could still be understood in some kind of mechanistic way sometimes, I think. Um, I can't explain this in much detail here, but at, and at the same time, I think that participatory sense making is not just an approach to intersubjectivity, but actually it could be the basis of understanding epistemology differently uh, in an engaged way. And this is what I try to explain with the notion of um, loving and knowing. Um, and so this need for a different epistemology turns around letting things be, um, which is a notion that goes back to uh, Heidegger's thinking and also yeah, many other people's thinking. But one philosopher who explains this very well in a paper from 2002 is Kim McLaren. She is at Ryerson in, uh, in Toronto. So she talks about the problem of letting things be and she illustrates this with the example of a horse and a horse trainer. And um, she talks about a horse trainer who, who is just interested in making money with the horse and he trains and trains the horse. Um, and eventually the horse breaks down and is just tired and, and broken from this hard training. Um, and this horse, by this horse trainer has not been let be. It, it's not, its being has not been respected it's not been properly engaged with it's not been recognized as a horse as also a playful animal an animal that needs to roam and 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 um, yeah and it's also not been recognized in its this hoarseness this particular hoarseness the, the the goal of the trainer has foregone any relationship to the being of the horse and actually thereby damages the horse um and this, I think, is really at the crux of epistemology. What we do and we know implies all of this, even if we are not used to think of, thinking of it like that in, in, traditional, in more traditional cognitive science. And the fact that we can get this so wrong, as, as Kim McLaren illustrates with this example, she says points to, the way to, to, the, to an issue, which is that we have to learn it. We have to learn letting things be. It's a delicate balancing act that we don't always get right. We, are, we actually often get it wrong and we learn it from letting others be. And to explain this, she goes back to an argument based on Merleau-Ponty's notion of, of intercorporeality and intersubjectivity. Um, so intercorporeality is that we live in an embodied shared world where we act on things also through others. So a good teacher of surfing, let's say, as I can see in San Sebastian sometimes, will see where students are in their capacities already. So maybe someone already knows how to jump up on the board. And then this teacher will be able to start teaching from there. Um, this is just a very quick uh, in, uh, explanation of that. Um, so we act on things also vicariously through seeing other people uh, doing that which is this intercorporeality. Um, intersubjectivity also means that we are mutually situating each other in the world. We, we, we kind of situate each other in the world where we are or where we should be. Um, anyway, the, I don't have so much time either to go into this here, but there is always this, this letting others be is always a mutual embodied project of letting others be in which we actively engage and which we actively take up. And we do that bodily. So this different uh, epistemology based on letting be starts from the, the, the issue that phenomena, letting them be always happens over against and at the same time together with my knowing them changing them. 
So my knowing a phenomenon is always changing it. And so phenomena are always underway between our knowing them and them being themselves. So the, my being as a knower impacts what I'm knowing and also vice versa. And this is something that keeps on going. And Merleau-Ponty also, uh, this is also one central part of his phenomenology, of course, where um, subject and, and object emerge out of um, the phenomenon or, or yeah, the phenomenon holds both of them at the same time in a way, and we can see them later as separate. Anyway, that's all super interesting and fascinating, but the phenomenon is always underway between knowers and known. Um, and so letting be is this balancing act between letting and being. So my letting the being of what I'm knowing be, or at least trying to do that. And so we should be careful to understand that letting be is not disengaging. It's not this idea, oh, let it be and things will be fine. It's, we cannot, in this, in what I'm talking about here, which is an epistemological relationship, it's not a matter of disengaging because then there is no epistemological relationship anymore and we don't know the thing anymore. So that's, that would be falling off the edge of what is knowing. Uh, of the spectrum of what is knowing. But we also cannot, letting be is also not overdetermining, which is what uh, traditional science tends to do a lot, is have a preconception and determine the thing and that's it. Uh, overdetermining is falling off the other edge of what is knowing still. Uh, it's uh, disengaging and overdetermining would be wrong ways of knowing in a way. So here, um, you have uh, an implication about knowing uh, where, where it goes wrong. So letting be is always engaging. Uh, it's paradoxical. Um, it's risky. It involves you as a knower uh, personally, and that makes it risky and, and can be scary. Um, and both known and knower continually change in this uh, relationship as well as their relationship changes all the time as well as they co-become with each other. And so these three things, knower and known, and their relationship are in relation with each other and ongoingly change. They cannot but ongoingly change. Um, yes, so does their relationship. Um, so this is perhaps difficult to understand. Um, but we know this dynamic well, somewhere specifically, and I think we know it well in our loving relationships. Um, and I'm talking here about uh, all kinds of, well, many different kinds of love relationships. It's, it's, it's particularly embodied in sexual relationships, I would say, but in, also in friendship and, and par parental relationships. Um, they are the quintessential place where we know, where we find and live this dynamic of this kind of non-detached knowing. So this inherent uh, tension um, of being ourselves and being in relation. And Jessica Benjamin describes this very nicely also in her work as a recognition that we must hold, which is a, a relationship um, of recognition where, uh, we recognize, the other recognizes us, and somehow we must hold this as well, however difficult it is and full of tensions all the time. Um, to illustrate this, I uh, also work on, on autism and interactions between autistic people and between autistic and non-autistic people. And one problem in uh, research on autistic interactions is that Again, like in the example of dementia and dementia care, we don't always uh, see how proficient and sophisticated autistic people are already at interacting because we have a fixed idea that they are uh, having problems with social interaction. And so we, in a way, determine already how they can interact by that, but they are actually capable of more interaction than we are used to seeing. And I won't... Um, talk about this example, but you can find it in the, in the, on the resource page, if you like, because I, I'm aware of time. So um, what love can illuminate about sense-making um, 
and I can't see my slide fully here and I don't know how to change it either. Um, um, what love can illuminate about sense-making is our deepest involvement as the beings we are, in those we understand, in people, things and events, and in the process of understanding them. And only if we understand this involvement do we understand human knowing, I think, our most um, sophisticated forms of human knowing. So I would say that an engaged or engaging epistemology has its paradigm case in love relationships. And so to understand this better, we need to understand the interactive and the individual self-organizations and normativities that are at play. So to come back to loving and knowing, um, in, this, in these kinds of relationships of loving and knowing, who loves and who knows matters. Lovers or uh, people who, who love each other um, and knower and known are particular. It's this particular person who is loving and we love that particular person. It could be that we love many people. It could be that we love um, maybe the world in general, as in the states that we were talking about before. I, I don't know that that's what we were talking about before seems a bit in tension with what I'm saying here. But in this, in this approach, where I, where I bring together loving and knowing, they are concrete and relational, and they're not universal, and they're not neutral. So it's, it's um, you cannot love or know abstractly. And by abstractly here, I mean, in a way that is um, pulled away from what we are loving or, or who we are loving and knowing. So abstract comes from Latin abstrare, which means uh, to pull away from, to pull apart, right? So to love is to navigate these various uh, tensions between the tendencies and the directions of one's own becoming, the other's becoming, and the becoming of the relation. So it's a co-becoming um, full of tensions of relating. And Paradox and struggle and tension and ambiguity are basic to this and completely to be expected. So lovers and knowers are concretely existentially implicated in their relation and an existential dialectic plays out between the individuals and the and their relation as well. So in loving and knowing there is a continual ongoing balancing act um, <laughs> I really would like to read my slides and I can't. Um, I don't know how to sort this. Wait, yes. I'm sorry about this. So, um, in loving and knowing, there is a continual ongoing balancing act between too much and too little determination between the knower who is busy letting be and the known who is being let be, which is also in a way an active thing to do. And this comes with a double-sided risk of determination. And this risk of determination is on the one hand um, being determined. So one is being determined by the other, by the relation or by yourself. And on the other hand, there is a risk of determining. You determine the other, the relation and yourself and these, it's always a balancing act between not um, doing either of this to such an extent that you stop existing or that you threaten your own existence or the other's existence or the existence of the relation, as we saw in the example of the horse trainer. Because the horse trainer, in a sense, is also um, forgoing his own capacities as a knower if he destroys the horse in his interaction with it. So some critical points, um, and this also relates, I think, to uh, John's talk. Um, but there are some buts. Um, what about essence? What about truth? And what about fact? Mm, in this approach, essence, fact, and truth are relational, and they are to be found in particular encounters between knower and world. Um, and what happens in these encounters can be tested or verified by others. Um, and that's uh, a kind of approach to objectivity, which is intersubjective. But I think more than this, we can expect 
that essences, truths, and facts are things that are never finished, that are constantly changing, and that yet are tangible and real within particular circumstances, within particular engagements, and that we also encounter there. And then another but that people sometimes raise when I present this is, um, but isn't this a rosy picture? Aren't you saying that um, um, if knowing is like, um, like loving, isn't this like a rosy romantic picture? Well, no, it's not because that's not the kind of uh, loving I have in mind. Because um, as I've been trying to say, this letting be is never finished. Knower and known, lover and loved are never finished. And their relationship isn't either. It's an ongoing dialectical tension that, that, um, yeah, that never stops um, until we die or maybe even after we die. Um, so it's an ongoing tension that animates our lives and it never lets us go. And it's a continual, inescapable, exasperating, moving dialectic, um, this, this business of lo loving and knowing. And then I would also like to add another um, critical uh, perspective or a critical uh, point about this, which is that we should listen carefully to black feminists and decolonization, decolonization theorists who teach us about the dangers of a loving, knowing ignorance. Because um, as several have pointed out, um, there is a danger that um, we do try to be uh, all inclusive and we try to have an inclusive love but actually unbeknownst to ourselves um, we might we, we exclude people as well and this is very dangerous and I think we should really be careful with that um, and uh, it's something that we tend to do and I sometimes do that myself too so, sort of before being aware of it um, but yeah, we, this is another dialogue that we have need to have from, from an active cognitive science with people who know oppression from the inside and who know that we are all different bodies. So that's what I said earlier when I, when I gave the quick slogans of the Linguistic Bodies book, we are all different bodies. Um, our own being as knowers, as scientists, as philosophers, as thinkers, is also being transgressed by what we know, and we should be open to that. We should have an openness to what Kim McLaren in a later, much later paper calls ontological intimacy. And this is the fact that we are unavoidably transgressed when we meet and when we engage in the world. And this is something that we be, need to be careful of and have responsibility for. So it's not others who are different, the subjects we determine, um, or which who we are used to determine, but everyone is different. Also, uh, we, me, myself, we are different. Um, and this, I think, entails a significant change for science and for the scientists, which we can only understand if we understand that we are all different in its full ramifications. And I think that means that we need to understand oppression also from the inside in order to really know this, or at least, at least listen to the people who speak about that and, and who therefore have that to say about this issue. So if we reground our understanding of participatory sense-making and unsettle the relation between scientist and research object and turn it into one of engagement, uh, which means transgression unavoidably and which we have to um, really take in, and I think this relates back also to one of Francisco Varela's papers about uh, not one, not two, um, where we are always in a relation between three terms, the elements and their relation, and all of all three of them change. Uh, also, yeah, the scientist or the knower. So to come back to the, the final, um, this is my final slide, my conclusion slide, and now I would like to see people again, so I have some intersubjectivity here. Um, I can see Roshi and uh, Evan, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, because here I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb as well and, and do something a little bit vulnerable, maybe. Does time open up between us? To come back to the initial question. 
I think if we can let each other be in the engaged, risky, fluctuating, undulating, exasperating, ambiguous, paradoxical ways that loving invites and that we know in, re in loving relations, I do think time can open up between us. And I would like to uh, say something about an experience um, like Amy had an example yesterday that kept coming, cropping up to her. I have one as well. And this is the experience of when my father died. Um, as I said yesterday, he died over a very long period of time in a way because he had dementia and we lost him over many years. But when he was going to actually die, um, I was called home and there were three more days with him that I had with my family as well. Um, which in these days is something that I was lucky to have because I realized that people now, when they lose people, are, cannot be with their loved ones. And that's very difficult. But um, in the last 10 minutes of his life, I kind of, my mom was there and my sister and I and my brother also in a sense. It was 10 minutes when he died, but in a sense, the experience as we were there opened up and it was as if there was an eternity in that moment. The, the experience was um, something uh, in a way non-emotional of complete presence to what was happening. And that in a way allowed time to open up. This was my experience and I wrote it down because I knew that I wouldn't fully know it again. So I, I made a note in my diary and now I can only tell it and not fully connect with it, but I wanted to hold on to it in some sense. And so I wrote about it to still have it. Um, so it was like there was an eternity in that moment, even though it was a moment of about 10 minutes. So it, both of these things were true. And this is a, a limit situation of course, being with someone dying, which um, uh, we had been for many years because of the dementia. But here this time opened up and I believe that this, um, this thing, time opening up, is also what characterizes intersubjectivity. It's something that we can also experience in intersubjectivity. In our encounters with each other, it's, hap it's what happens between us if we um, become sensitive to it, I think. As we come to know intersubjectivity better, both conceptually and experientially, with notions such as sense-making and participatory sense-making and loving and knowing, ontological intimacy, kinship, co-becoming, practices of mutual transformation, like teaching, therapy, education, and so on, and yet also still knowing that in all this, love is not and cannot be all inclusive, but instead transgresses, is difficult, is between people who will always remain different from each other and where there are tensions and frictions between each other, then I think we can come to know, to deeply bodily and interbodily know that there is time between us time to deal with uncertainty, openness, being present to this, pulling it open in a deepening and a deepened understanding, time opens up and urgencies may disappear or settle down a little bit as Kyle White, I think seems to suggest, and we can work towards a better future. So to get both a conceptual and an experiential deeper, deeper understanding of this, which has been the goal of Francisco Varela's work and the beginning of the inactive approach, brings, and especially I think, in, brings this possibility. And I think it does so, especially in the notions of participatory sense-making and loving and knowing. And I think in the end, for me, and this is the final thing I will say, um, it's, I'm, tr I'm understanding my work more and more as being about understanding participation conceptually better. And by doing that, by providing these concepts, helping people to understand it better and thereby also making it better in experience. And this is in a way the goal of my work, which 
relates directly back to to um, the work that Francisco did. And that's it. Mm, thank you so very much, Hannah. I greatly appreciate your presentation. And uh, before I turn it over to uh, Evan uh, for his uh, comments or perhaps questions to you, uh, just a couple of quick observations. I spent most of my research career uh, focused on dementia, particularly, although not exclusively, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, two things. We started off studying emotion by using these conceptual kind of tasks, categorizing facial expressions, that sort of thing. Uh, we came to quite different conclusions once we started measuring physiological emotional reactivity. So not to assume that conceptual representation uh, describes the entire domain. Second is uh, from my clinical life with these same individuals. Patient I saw very early on, uh, very, very severely impaired in memory and conceptual reasoning, and yet had extraordinarily well-preserved social skills. Uh, which initially seemed very puzzling to me until I later learned that she and her husband twice a week went ballroom dancing. Well. So Evan, to you. Thanks, Al. Uh, well, thank you, Hannah. That was a, a very um, beautiful, deep and rich talk. And there's um, there's there's lots of thoughts that that come to mind um, that I look forward to talking to you more about. But but one thing that that comes to mind specifically with regard to the question about time opening up between this. So this is this is a comment, I suppose, um, is the imagination. So this actually this connects back to what we were talking about yesterday with the imagination what we might think of as a kind of inactive imagination. And this is also, uh, interestingly, a point that I learned from Kyle White. And it has to do with his idea that, again, he's taking from his understanding of, of indigenous epistemologies of what he calls spiraling time and counterfactual dialogue. And so before I say exactly what that means, let me let me just say personally how I how I came to this uh, this paper where he talks about these things is I had been reading a lot of literature about the Anthropocene and about the climate crisis, and most of that literature frames it either you know explicitly and deliberately or implicitly in terms of apocalypse, and the idea again of a kind of you know stable world that then is um, rent asunder by this unprecedented cataclysmic event. And in and in one of Kyle White's papers, he points out that this is, of course, a particular way of framing time and a different way of, which belongs to crisis epistemology, and a different way of framing time in um, a kinship sense of coordination epistemology has to do with imagining a spiraling time in which you're engaged in a dialogue in the space of imagination with your ancestors who would hope that you would be able to live in a certain way, would envision you as flourishing in the world in a certain way. So you're engaged in a dialogue with them in which you have a responsibility to them to, you know, to uh, make that as much possible as you can. And then, of course, you're engaged imaginatively in a dialogue with your ancestors. I'm sorry, with your descendants, where you want to be a you know a good ancestor to your descendant. And in the space of imagination, you put the descendants in conversation with the ancestors, as if you know the time is spiraling, and and you know you're here and they're here and they're here, and there's there's a sort of direct line between you in the space of imagination through the spiral, and it's it's a way I think. So when I read this paper, it just completely, you know, opened up. It it it, it completely sort of dismantled the assumption I had of climate crisis as this apocalyptic event. I mean, that's how I had been thinking about it too. And when I when I read this way of framing it, it it completely changed things for me in a way that emphasized a kind of temporal 
intersubjectivity and participatory sense making across time that I could participate in, but that I had to participate in through the imagination. Yeah. So it explicitly involves mental time travel, which is you know something that would be interesting to talk about. Good ways of good ways of mentally time traveling versus you know not so not so good ways. So it's just, this is just really you know I'd love to hear what you think about this, but it's it's a comment about how in the space of the imagination we can open up things in in ways that um, may enhance our ability to open them up in other ways here and now. So that that was one thought. And then the second is is more of a question, more of a direct question, and that is, so you know, here I just can't help being a philosopher. Um, so at one point, you know, you said, well, but what about fact and essence and and truth? And it it seemed to me there that you were trying to recuperate these notions, which is in within a relational framework, which is which is certainly a strategy, but I wonder whether we need to hold on to all of those notions, particularly essence. I wonder whether that's just an idea that we don't really need to take with us. Um, you know, fact, truth, depending on how we frame those notions, but essence. So I just wanna hear more from you, you know, what you think in that notion is important to carry forward in response to someone who might be skeptical about the need for that particular baggage on our trip? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, I don't have it in directly in my mind what I would want to reply to that right now. I, I do find myself sometimes saying the essence of this notion of loving and knowing like this is, and then I get into trouble. And then that maybe that's why I mentioned it. Um, um, but I don't actually, I, I'm not uh, finding it further than that, what I, what I would like to say to it. But I really like also your other remark about the, the imagination and, and the dialogue across time. Uh, thank you for that one, yeah. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Evan, for uh, those comments and questions. I'd like to also open it up now to uh, the other faculty, this is uh, uh, in part our discussion of your presentation, Hannah, and also in part our uh, final panel session where we're uh, really making an effort to try to integrate uh, across different things. Uh, and one thing I, I would um, request uh, from the faculty is uh, take a look at some of uh, what has been being posted uh, in the Q&A. Uh, there are some from our Spanish speaking participants and John, I'm grateful for uh, your response. And, and uh, uh, perhaps maybe you might, if, if there are some particularly uh, connecting things that uh, you've seen there, convey those to the rest of us uh, using English. Uh, but also, uh, uh, you know, see if it's possible to bring in some of the concerns that are being uh, expressed by our participants. So, John, I noticed that you had uh, uh, just put something up. Uh, and so uh, no, would you like a, to make a response? It was just a quick question. I'll maybe, I think Hannah maybe sees it, but I'll just translate it that uh, Ingrid, Ingrid was just wondering, Hannah, whether you... Uh, you in, in in this in this approach, whether you made use of the work of um, Anna Anna Jean Air in respect to your hypothesis about uh, sensorial integration. Yeah, I don't know that work, um, but if um, and I also don't know if sensorial integration is the same work that so someone else in the Q and A has asked what the name is of the person who did the dance research with the moving with, and that's related to that question. I think in that the name of the person who did that research is Kevin Lee uh, at McGill University. And he, wor he works with his supervisor, Melissa Park together. And I think in their approach to um, occupational ther th therapy, they use uh, sensorial integration, I think, but I'm not sure if it's exactly, if, if this refers to the same thing. Um, but I will also share the, the a PDF of my slides with all the references. 
So if people are wanting the references and the names of authors I mentioned, I will put that on my slides PDF. Wonderful. And for the participants, those are all uh, going to be findable within the resources for this symposium on the Upaya website. You know, uh, Roshi, I'd be particularly interested in hearing from you uh, in regard to, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, even though a, a popular sort of take on Zen practice uh, is one that pictures the individual practitioner perhaps facing the wall uh, in Zazen meditation. And yet uh, it is a very deeply relational practice. So anything responsive to some of Hannah's points about relationality that you want to add? Yeah, thank you so much, Al. Um, you know, a couple of things came up for me. Actually, many things came up for me in your presentation, Hannah. I, th I really uh, thank you so much. Um, Adam just posted uh, koans in the stream. And um, one of the fascinating uh, things about a koan practice is that it uh, is a process of de uh, decentering fundamental decentering out of your own perspective and the development of your capacity to uh, expand your subjectivity to include all of the elements of the koan into your so-called identity. And that you, you know, you, you can only, you cannot explain a koan. Like if, you know, you can say, for example, of the three bodies of the Buddha, which one does not fall into categories. And then, you know, the response, of the master is, I am always intimate with it. So, you know, that, that's a really uh, beautiful example of this uh, experience that uh, is through direct practice realization of uh, intersubjectivity. In other words, that the minute you go to a kind of uh, reductionistic or conceptual uh, analysis of the three kayas, you know, in, in, the, in, in the Buddhist perspective, um, you, you, you've lost it. Um, what is the experience always in koan is this identification, almost like gestalt therapy with all of the elements of the koan, which then teaches you about being in this inactive field. In other words, you're not separate from the atmosphere that you're breathing. You're not separate from the rainforest that's producing the atmosphere. So it's a much more inactive perspective. And I would suggest that in terms of tech, traditional ecolo uh, ecological knowing or knowledge, but I think it's knowing, uh, even though tech usually refers, and it's not T-E-C-H, but T-E-K, um, uh, uh, that uh, the there's a... Um, uh, misidentification of the term knowledge as a thing instead of knowing as a process. So traditional ecological knowing um, is knowing that is the realization or the direct experience of intersubjectivity. You know, I also suggest from the Zen perspective, there's something that is called mind to mind transmission. And um, what is, uh, it has to do with the student teacher relationship, but it actually is how you really learn in Zen. Although uh, we're, you know, kind at Upaya, we give meditation instruction, but in actuality, um, how I first uh, learned in Zen was not never through directions, never through instruction. It was always in this experience of, um, expanding one's subjectivity to include the teacher or advanced practitioners into your experience. And then it's happening at this very subtle somatic level. And uh, so that's a, another thing that I, I wanted to uh, just to point to. Um, the third thing in Zen has to do, if you will, with the ritual process. And I mentioned Levi Brule yeah, yesterday. Um, that the actual process of session, which includes facing the wall, which would seem like a very uh, uh, um, almost a, a sort of punitive, uh, you know, if you're put in the corner, you're facing the wall, you're cut off from uh, 
the uh, general uh, access to the experience of others. But actually what happens, you know, when your back is to the whole field and everybody's back is to the whole field, that another level of knowing opens up. Your sensory experience becomes much more subtle as a result of not being engaged at the level of personality and even, you know, sort of reassurance. Um, it's as though you have a, a third body opening up that um, swells out of this experience that looks like it's solipsistic or solitudinous, and in fact, um, actually produces, you know, much deeper experience, I believe, at least, you know, in having done it for over 50 years now, you know, of bonding with those who are in the same space with you, that where differences um, are not emphasized, but relationship is in spite of the fact or because of the very fact that you are facing the wall. Mm, thank you, Roshi. Amy, your presentation, uh, of course, was very explicitly addressing uh, intimate relationship and the loss of intimate relationship. So I wonder whether you have things you'd like to comment on Hannah's talk or questions? It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, there's, there's lots of things to think about. I mean, many, many things to think about, including, um, I guess you could say the, the big question of the ethical ramifications of thinking inactively and what it means for doing science, which you brought up, which I think is a, is a really big, important question to, to focus on. But I also thought about this notion of opening, I don't know what you think about this idea when you were talking about opening up time. I mean, that just, as soon as you put that up, I just thought, yeah, you know, uh, that's, that's it. And, um, but I was thinking whether or not this could also be related to um, not only the micro interactions that you're talking about, but also a little bit what I was talking about when I was talking about losing oneself and grieving. And of course, when one loses oneself and grieving, that's an example of losing oneself. But you might say that you're losing yourself all the time when you're moving from state to state in, in this relational nexus. And I'm wondering whether or not that too um, doesn't have to do with um, how we live time. Yes. I think so, yes. <laughs> it's actually a question that, that you know, it, it, I haven't really thought about it very much. It just um, presented itself to me during the symposium on the basis of Evan Stoke and, and what I knew I was going to talk about. And so it's to me a very new question too. But what, what you said reminded me of um, uh, Alfonso Lingis, who talks about the imperative of the world and who says that we lose ourselves all the time when we perceive things. We, we stop existing in a certain way in every perception. Um, so that's the connection that I made with it. But other than that, it's, it's something I still have to think about a lot as well, yeah. Mm, thank you. Uh, Elena, I had noticed uh, during uh, the, the talk uh, that uh, you had a couple of, of things you had posted in, in the chat. And one of them, had to do with um, this notion of the body boundary as a kind of interface of, of connection. And the other had to do with uh, the difference between uh, loving abstractly, which Hannah was referencing, uh, and in, in the sense of that not being what she was talking about, uh, but also the difference between that and non-referential love. Anything more you'd like to say or ask? Um, thank you all. Um, yes, I was just, I might have wrongly assumed, Hannah, that you, you were um, in the way of relating to what I was trying to express as a kind of this non-referential uh, love. It, it, it's not an abstract love uh, in the sense that it, it's not distant. It, it's very immediate. <laughs> um, um, it, it, it's being non-referential love. 
which is different from an abstract love for the whole world, if I understood um, um, the way you were relating to, to, to what I was saying. But um, what I wanted to, to share, if, if there is time, um, so if it got triggered a, a personal uh, memory, which is related to uh, the end of the talk by Han, uh, Hannah and then um, Al, which you have mentioned about your work with people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, and, and Roshi, your account of this mind-to-mind -mind transmission uh, in Buddhism, of course, in Dzogchen, we have mind-to-mind -mind transmission, the teacher pointing out the nature of mind. And my, one of my early experiences of what I would now refer to as non-dual awareness um, actually came um, in the context of, you know, being a young pioneer, age of 15, in growing up in the Soviet Union, and we all had to volunteer in some way or another in the community. And I was working in the old people's house. And there was this lady with progressive Alzheimer's. Um, and I had to kind of tidy up her room and sort of interact with her. And I had uh, absolute conviction. She had, she had never noticed me. She had no idea of who I was. Um, but she was present in this incredible state of peace. And all she did all day long is sitting on the chair, looking out um, of the window. And one day I took a chair and I sat next to her. And I asked her, what are you looking at? And she said, how the light, light is changing. <laughs> and boom, I was just you know, not the time opening between us, but the space opening <laughs> between us and the time ceasing to exist. And then I, I was just in the state, which now we will use the words, you know, clarity, luminosity <laughs> and, and all pervasive love, but that was it, you know, and I didn't need any words. You know, I was just pulled in her experiential space um, by allowing myself to open up, I, I became curious about what it is that is her experience. Uh, and that sort of propelled me into her experiential space. I, I experienced what she, she did. And I mean, the, the word intersubjectivity somehow is clumsy for me because it's again, it's two subjects relating to each other. It, it, it was just absence of intersubjectivity because there was the, the, there was an ex experientiality there, <laughs> you know, that's it, full stop. Clubs, you know, it's our struggle with words to try to communicate um, our experiences, but this is something I wanted to share, so thank you. Thank you. So I, I wanted to, to bring in something uh, that comes from the participants in the, the Q&A. And this makes contact both with Hannah's presentation, uh, but also with uh, things that Amy had to say and, and some of Evan's presentation. So this is from Nancy Hardaway, who writes, when we grieve, don't we step across time in a way sort of what Evan was mentioning ancestrally, et cetera. We are stepping across the present into the past where the other existed and into the future where the other doesn't exist except within us. So any replies to that observation? You can unmute yourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I, mean, I would say yes. Um, I mean, this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot this year through the experience of many different kinds of losses. They're, they're the losses you just read about, of which there are many and continue to be many. I just read about India this morning. And so there's that. And then there's the very, very personal intimate losses of which I've experienced quite a few this year. And one of the things I've noticed is the way that it affects my sense of time. Mm. And I'm not even in a position to sort of say all the ways that it affects my perception of time. Some of them are quite small scale effects on micro temporal things. Um, others are large in terms of mental time travel and 
a sense of a, of a past that one of the things that's actually struck me quite a bit is that when you share experiences with someone and then you're both able to revisit them in memory together and talk about, oh, those times when you did such and such or that wonderful time when you experienced, you know, whatever it might have been. And then that person is gone, but you're still here. I mean, this is this is not a particularly deep observation, but it's it's as if you know, part of you is gone as well. There's an unrecoverability now. And it completely alters my sense of my own personal time. That, you know, that my own personal time in, in, in the time of the world, I suppose you could say. And yeah, so that's just to, you know, to, to make, to make it relate to my own personal experience recently. So, so this is something I think that's very, that's very much related to participatory sense making and to to the particular mode of grief in that kind of sense making. Yeah. Thank you, Evan. No. You know, in a way, um, uh, how we have evoked Francisco and his work, reaching back into the past, but also seeing how uh, his view and his vision, his work, have shaped. Um, our past and also our present and um, is it overlighting presence as we move into the future. And so, you know, we, Evan and I had a brief exchange uh, before uh, uh, everyone gathered about uh, Gregory Bateson's notion of the metalogue. And that is that um, we are uh, the thing that we are exploring is how we are exploring. The thing uh, that we are speaking about is actually what is happening between us. And um, I would suggest that, you know, by uh, working with uh, the ancestral presence of Francisco, also feeling Bill in Maturana, um, and how uh, uh, in Western society, uh, the ancestral dimension is shed and the effects you know, on us as a community when we uh, uh, leave the past behind, so to speak, and aren't guided by the, the wisdom that uh, has been uh, uh, evoked by those who have passed before us. Mm. Thank you, Roshi. Well, I'm, and I'm gonna go, go over to uh, John momentarily. But uh, since Roshi's on the screen right at the moment, I just wondered whether, given some of Hannah's comments about uh, this uh, relationally dependent plasticity of time, um, you've brought Dogen into the conversation a couple of times. Anything you want to say about being time? Uh, Uji, time yeah. being. Um, I, you know, I feel like uh, Dogen really... Uh, um, articulated this vision of the confluence of time and being. And I, I think, Hannah, you know, I, I'll send you that fascicle. I think you'll find it fascinating because it is also a metalogue. It, you know, it produces this sense of temporal plasticity and spatial plasticity that uh, you are uh, uh, pointing to in your presentation, Uji. I, I'll also put Uji up on uh, time being up on uh, the resource page. Uh, Dogen, um, you know, just as I believe he did in the Genjo Koan, and the same uh, sensibility is also conveyed in the Genjo Koan, certainly in Uji, uh, you know, what you're addressing in terms of the plasticity of time as it is experienced in the encounter with others. But I would also suggest it's not just two-legged others. You know, from the point of view of uh, indigenous knowing, um, that plasticity of time comes in the encounter with place. And you certainly uh, have that feeling, for example, going to a place like uh, Chaco Canyon, where time is marked, but in order to mark time, um, you know, in this, uh, the conditions of 
a thousand years ago, um, you know, someone had to sit for generations, so to speak, through time observing celestial bodies. And so, you know, that's an experience of temporal plasticity, but also creating order uh, out of what one observes. But just the, you know, when you're there and you imagine, how did they figure that out? You know, it's, uh, it is uh, transgenerational and a different uh, conception of being in time that I think many of us uh, have, you know, in a, a world where time is parsed, carefully measured, there's not enough of it. You know, we have a whole uh, epistemology around time related to technology that is uh, very, uh, I think, destructive of love. I just want to, if I could just throw in there, is just the idea of how how broken, how alienated the scientific and physical, you know, that, that was produced by physics, the vision of time and, you know, the technologies which flew out, fl have flown out of it, and then locked us into this raw, very brittle, rigid, and wrong version uh, of time. Uh, Adam, I'd love for you to say a bit more about that. Um, yeah, well, it's funny because it was the, the subject of my second book. I was looking at how how um, technology shaped cosmology, how, you know, the, the literal, the, the, the timekeeping technologies from the first clocks on to, you know, which, which were just bells, basically. There were no first hands. Second hands didn't show up until the late 1700s. Um, how they shaped literally our theories about time in the universe. Because what they did is what was happening is we were locking ourselves into uh, ever more um, uh, metered time. Whereas, you know, I, I like to think about it in the 10th century, if you ask somebody what time it was, they'd be like lunch, you know? I mean, <laughs> there, it wasn't like there was a lot of technology for time. There were sundials and such, but most people, they, you know, most people didn't have one. Um, and that most, it was, it was the sun. It was the, it was the, as you said, the other legged time. Um, and then, you know, uh, we developed these ever better ways of metering time and breaking it up until you finally had, you know, minute hands, which completely reshaped the nature of work, right? Now you're punching in and you got to get in at 106 because at 107, you're late and you're going to get doc pay. Um, and then that turns into now the digital time where like every microsecond, I was very, um, uh, Elena, in your talk, the idea and, and Richard, yours as well, the idea that like, yeah, microseconds, you know, the idea of, of seeing how thought progresses in microseconds. Um, and now that technology is used against us as people are following our, our, our um, keystrokes. How many microseconds has it been from for your last keystrokes? So we Mill, just, milliseconds, milliseconds. Sorry, milliseconds, milliseconds. Yeah, which is actually that's interesting because milliseconds is still kind of in the human realm almost. And you get to microseconds and now you're in the, the physics, the abstract realm. So just to close this off, it's just like this was a this was a, a technologically mediated version of time, which is not a human time at all. But we built technologies which we've literally, in, in you know, uh, imprisoned ourselves in, and it's just and and in so many ways, it's and God forbid, artificial technology. Once those technologies start getting deployed on us, you know. Then we we really we're going to end up being the robots that the uh, you know the AI scientists were you know dreaming about. This conversation is making me miss Bill. <laughs> <laughs> when you have when you're counting time in milliseconds and maybe even microseconds, there are no more horizons, are there? Yeah, there can't be. Oh. well. We've had some ideas. Uh, I'm also seeing in the Q and A and and the chat stream uh, concerning phrases like uh, becoming time slaves and time is money. So uh, certainly they abound in our current culture. Uh, John Dunn had uh, some questions for Hannah, but John, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> so go ahead. Well, you know the transmission that. Uh, both Roshi and Elena talked about of, which is really interesting. And this is actually kind of part of a question for you, Hannah, that transmission. So this is this really highly thematized moment in which in the Tibetan tradition, the non-dual Tibetan traditions of Mahmudra and Dzogchen, it's re referred to as Tu Yi Sewa, 
which means the literal the mixing of two minds, uh, embodied minds, obviously, because it's done in presence, right? And uh, what they say is that this occurs not in the past, not in the future, and not in the present. It occurs in the fourth time, the timeless time, the time outside of time, which reminds me very much of that moment of your own experience, which is very similar to my experience when I was with my mother when she passed away. And sort of somehow that moment of death, and I'm sure Roshi could say a lot about this, that moment of death, we seem to slip into that fourth time. So part of what I wonder also is whether there's a sense in which, and, and as uh, I think it was Adam that said that, you know, we've lost this kind of, the past is, I mean, the, one of the typical tropes, and Evan mentioned this yesterday, the typical tropes of modernity is progress. And like, you know, Stephen Dedalus, James Joyce's character in Ulysses says that uh, history is a nightmare from which I'm struggling to awake. It's like the, you know, the pure modernist voice, which is the past is, you know, gone. We don't want the past. We want the future. But that fourth time, that timeless time in these traditions is very heavily dependent on a kind of structure that is a structure of lineage of the past. So that you're not just getting something that is kind of, you know, in a sense, you know, new or fresh. It is new and fresh, but it's also transmitted over time in this timeless moment. And I'm just wondering whether there is that kind of a play of the now, like the past sounds like we've been kind of saying like the past is fully present and even like all past and future are fully present in this, in, in this moment in which they also collapse. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether the temporal aspects that you've been talking about are also kind of temporal collapse on the one hand and on the other, not really exactly a question. Well, this is also a question then that whether part of what's going on there also is that there's an explicit communication, right? But in this kind of moment, that moment is a moment where there are sometimes words are used. Sometimes they're not used actually, but they're often used, but there's an explicit like linguistic communication, but part of thematically what's said to be happening is that there's another kind of communication that we're aware of, but it's not explicit. It's not like propositional. Like there's another kind of knowing that's happening in parallel and whether that's also part of this participatory sense-making. And then and I'm going to give you one more question or maybe a, a suggestion or a question of maybe what you've been thinking about. And this is kind of, re, you know, uh, drawing all, also on what Roshi said about Levi Brühl. And I, I'm a big Durkheimian kind of type of guy. I really am very fond of Durkheimian ways of approaching social reality or really just reality in general. And whether there is a there is a way in which that kind of participatory, participatory sense making is can be facilitated by a sort of ritual structure. Mm -hmm. Part of what a ritual structure allows you to do is no longer be yourself, right? You're no, you're you're out of or, your ordinary world. You're maybe maybe you're playing a role, or maybe you're not. But in a certain way, the you know ritual structures, and I think we see this in many different traditions, are an invitation to stop being who you are, and to be who you are for, and to enter the ritual. In a sense, some rituals require you die before you enter the ritual, right? Ritually die. So I'm also wondering whether ritual structure could could uh, could be part of what facilitates this in your experience. Like, and you know, sometimes it can be very explicit and sometimes it's more just, you come into a certain kind of room or a certain kind of space that's got a structure that permits that. So, you know, collapse of time, the role of a kind of non, non thetic, uh, uh, in, you know, I don't know, I didn't want to use the word intuition, but you know, maybe something like non-propositional or implicit knowledge and also the way in which ritual structures can facilitate this type of sense-making, this participatory sense-making. So I don't know if any of that, you want to respond to any of that, if any of that makes sense to you. <laughs> it makes a little sense, some of it. Um, and, I mean, these are, are um, traditions and authors that I'm not familiar enough, enough with to actually say something about. Um, so I, I hesitate um, to do so because I already went out on a limb with the question about uh, does time open up between us? That was, you know, is far from my thinking normally. So, um, um, but maybe the second question about um, non-propositional understanding between us, um, if I understand it, um, what you meant by it. Um, 
that for sure goes on uh, in intersubjectivity and participatory sense making a lot. It's definitely not um, at a pro propositional level only. On the contrary, I mean that's yeah. We we understand each other bodily very sophist in sophisticated ways that we don't often don't notice and some only sometimes rise to our awareness. But we you know. There's a lot of that going on, and it can be shown in all kinds of ways as well. I don't know if you're referring to that kind of thing, but I am. Yes, definitely. Yeah. But do you have a do you, do you have a way of referring to that type of knowing? I think it's many different things, um, but some things that play a role in it are that we can, for instance, coordinate heartbeats or breathing rhythms while we improvise music together, and those kinds of things have been amply shown, and they play a role in this. Um, in, in how we understand each other. And that role is not a, a, a simple mapping of, of, of synchrony and time, for instance, heartbeat synchronization doesn't map onto good understanding in terms of uh, what we are talking about necessarily. In fact, they can actually be quite discoordinated or, or these le levels, which is not a good word, but they, they um, interplay in complex ways as well. And there's a lot of research on that, yeah. And the other things I, I, yeah, I feel too much out of my depth to respond to. <laughs> check check <Yeah>. out Durkheim. <laughs> yeah, think, for sure. Yeah. yeah, really resonates very strongly for me with what you're can, talking about. Can I add something quickly about that? Please. Yeah. Um, so I also love Durkheim, um, which means we agree about something, John. <laughs> and um, We won't hold you to it. <laughs> right. We, ha we um, have written a paper together, Dave. <laughs> that's true. We have. We have. That's true. Um, I think that uh, I think ritual is extremely important in participatory sense making and, and understudied and very interesting. And I think one philosophical tradition that's actually quite interesting in this regard is Neo-Confucianism. So these are thinkers like you know Wang Yangming and Zhu Xi, because what these thinkers you know in the in the Song and Ming Dynasty in China, what they're doing is they're drawing on the Confucian underst understandings of of ritual as precisely a kind of enactment of a reality in which you assume alternate roles. So, mm -hmm. you know, a son becomes a grandfather or a father to his father. And this, this enables you to open up again in a way in a space of imagination that you concretely realize physically, you know, alternative, alternative social roles, which is a way of stepping outside yourself. I mean, and this connects to love because in Confucian thinking, the method of ren or benevolence or humaneness is said to be sympathy of which explicitly is said to be putting yourself in an alternate role in relationship to others which in the context of the ritual are occupying your role and one of the things that's interesting about this in neo-confucian thinking is that neo-confucianism explicitly incorporates a number of ideas from the buddhist tradition and then reacts back critically towards it precisely around issues of love because the neo-confucians are particularists in a way they think you know and this is within the context of you know chinese society they think you know buddhism means rejecting filial piety because buddhism is about monasticism and the confucians are about you know the devotional role of the son to the father and so the, the Confucians take up Buddhist ideas and kind of recraft them and particularize them in certain ways. And the argument basically is, unless you, and I'm not saying this argument is right or wrong, I'm just giving the argument, unless you kind of anchor these ideas of benevolence or compassion in particular relationships that you enact and sculpt through ritual, you actually can't magnify them or expand them out properly in the right way. So there's a very interesting kind of debate between the Buddhists and the and the Neo-Confucians that takes place over centuries um, about these that I think would be really you know, interesting to think about for, for participatory sense making and love and, and all of the things we're talking about. Thank you, thank you. Uh, related to uh, this discussion about ritual, uh, in the Q&A stream, Roshi uh, Robert Althaus writes, ritual can give form to something meaningful for the community, which can't be easily described or defined. And perhaps in doing so, it helps participants feel the weight of the moment 
which is this time being that Dogen speaks of. So mm -hmm. thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Wonderful. You know, I think um, another thing about the ritual process that is important to note is that um, it is communal. Um, it, in, in other words, it is happening between people and um, not only between people, but for people. And um, so there's this experience of entrainment that allows the sense of individuality or the small self to drop away. Thank you, Roshi. So you're mentioning of, of this uh, term entrainment uh, uh, and our discussion uh, just moments ago reminds me um, something I want to ask of, of Richie, uh, and I see your hand up, so you can feel free to uh, go with whatever you were thinking about rather than responding to this if you choose. Uh, but uh, because your laboratory has studied neural synchrony, uh, this very small time scale, widespread um, coordinate activity seen in the brain, there's also been some studies of uh, neural synchrony that's intersubjective between people. Uh, anything you'd want to observe in regard to that? And then please go ahead with whatever it is you were going to ask or say. Thank you, Al. Um, and thank you, Hannah, for a beautiful talk. Uh, uh, and Hannah was alluding to uh, work on uh, synchronized interactions, which can be observed at many different, um, in many different channels, so to speak, in behavior, uh, but also in the brain. Uh, and one of the, th and, and it, one of the really interesting things is that um, uh, this phenomenon in meditators uh, is something that uh, occurs not just with person-to-person uh, -person interaction, but applies more generally to interaction with the environment. And so there is increased synchrony between um, uh, events occurring in the environment that are not social and, um, and the brain uh, that you can uh, easily see. Uh, um, uh, uh, and one metaphor uh, you might, that has been used for this is that as the mind becomes uh, more still and quiet, it's um, you can you can envision it as a still lake, uh, and um, ripples can be discerned more clearly on a still lake that may be uh, um, perturbed by various kinds of uh, external events going on, and so there is increased resonance more generally. Um, but one of the comments that I wanted to make uh, is that. One of the areas of participatory sense making, which I think is so um, central to the um, uh, uh, to some of the issues around love that we've been talking about, uh, are parent-child interactions uh, over the course of development, and there's been a lot of work on this um, uh, and the kind of synchrony. Uh, uh, to which Hana was alluding to. And, and clearly, um, given that this begins before an infant has any um, uh, kind of uh, sophisticated conceptual apparatus, uh, it really is clearly, um, a lot of it is occurring preconceptual, con, uh, preconceptually, uh, and maybe even preconceptionally, um, because uh, uh, there is actual work showing that during pregnancy, um, there are um, uh, uh, there is this kind of synchrony as well, uh, and that you know leads me to um, uh, uh, one other suggestion, which I'll just plant a seed. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the uh, intergenerational transmission of trauma, uh, and that is also a kind of participatory sense making. Uh, of a destructive sort, uh, but uh, the, um, the fact that there is intergenerational transmission of trauma and we're beginning to learn about some of the mechanisms that may be associated with it, um, there also is very likely 
the intergenerational transmission of flourishing, of well-being, of awakening. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there is every reason to think that it operates through these same basic mechanisms. Mm. Thank you, Richie. So Adam Frank has uh, uh, posted in the, the chat stream uh, his observation that uh, uh, this relates to the idea that all science requires the workshop, which is a special kind of social interaction. You want to say anything more about that, Adam? And then there's a related comment uh, uh, that I saw from John questioning whether all human cognition is in some sense social. You know, the interesting thing for me, you know, as, as a physicist, right, I, I started as a physicist or, you know, I got entranced by the idea as a very young person for the idea of, you know, the perfect, the perfect um, God's eye view of reality, right, which in some sense, ironically for me was a response to my brother's death, right, I, you know, I wanted something that was eternal and perfect, uh, a knowledge that was eternal and perfect. Um, I, you know, which is some sense a bomb to the suffering I felt because of the trauma I was experiencing. Uh, you know, and this, but, but, you know, regardless of my own personal experience, this is such a clear idea in, in physics, right? Mathematics and physics as the, you know, the lower, the basal ground of science considers itself in reductionist thinking to be this, you know, this is what everything else stands on. And all other truths from all the other sciences are reducible back to the truths of mathematics and science and physics. And, you know, i now, I no longer think that idea is true, but uh, that is still very much the, um, the view of, you know, many, if not most of my colleagues in the physical sciences. Uh, so in the work that um, Evan and I have been doing on this book, The Blind Spot, there is a, a, a book by a philosopher Robert Kreese, who's a phenomenologist called, um, I forgot what the full title is, but it's something, it's, it's the, I think the workshop is in the subtitle. Um, but Kreese has this idea, he looks at a number of influential thinkers in the history of science, starting with Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon was, you know, had this idea of that we were gonna create special places where that would be sort of removed from the, 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 the truck of society, the, you know, the, 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 the tumult of society, where we could isolate you know, uh, uh, causes and effects. And the, literally the term he uses is to vex nature. This is where we could vex nature, which was, you know, to poke and prod um, to get nature to give up her secrets. And I think it is actually the feminine because of course that was the view, you know, in that sense. Um, but that, the, the, you know, what has been lost uh, in our in, in modern thinking about science is that you know there was always the workshop. The workshop was this place where you would you would isolate you'd be able to isolate um, the particular phenomena you were interested in. And, and um, then with other people, because they would have their version of the workshop as well, be able to just concentrate on that and find what um, uh, Bitbowl, the phenomenologist Bitbowl calls the structural invariance, temperature, momentum, you know, um, uh, uh, energy. And so then the problem, what has happened with science and the science's role in culture is we mistook temperature for being more real than, oh, I'm cold or like, whoo, I'm hot. We somehow thought that the temperature is the real thing and that the actual bodily experience of hot and cold was an epiphenomena. And that I think is so much the problem that we face today, the culture, the, the, the profound alienation that we have the climate crisis, you know, uh, and recognize and see it in th this way as the aberration of our, of what is normal human activity. Um, but so that, that by it's, it's the importance of the workshop is recognizing that science was always a social activity carried out in a very special sort of requiring special social relations, special physical relationships um, and then somehow we forgot that. We forgot that and we thought that the scientific view of reality was the act, that's actual reality and everything that's happening to us is, is less important and, and less true. And it's actually the other way around. You know, uh, Adam, what, one of the things that comes up for me is how science seeks certainty and also to promote certainty in society instead of 
meeting uh, uncertainty and creating the, the platforms of, a to of uh, not only a high tolerance for uncertainty, but a, a profound appreciation for uncertainty. Thanks, Richard. Maybe you can see this with the, uh, I'll just I'll briefly say this, with how scientists, myself included, have to talk to the public about climate change. Because if we try and say, look, science is this process where we're, oh, there's always things we don't know. You know, there's, a, they we're always yeah. in some state of uncertainty. It gets used against us. And that's exactly how organized, well-funded climate denial attack the scientists. They don't know anything. Listen to them. They're, they're never going to say they're certain. And so then the scientists are forced to sort of act like they're more certain, you know, or live in a world of certainty that they, they of course, know that that's not possible. So now you can't even, climate scientists can't even talk about their own science in a way that makes sense to them. But it's just, you know, it's an incredible irony from, the, you know, my, my own experience to look at how we are resistant uh, averse toward uncertainty when uncertainty pervades everything. Indeed. Uh, relevant to uh, uh, some of the points that uh, were just made, Elena notes in the chat stream, the difference between scientism versus science. Also very important. Uh, John, something you would like to say on this question you have of whether all human cognition is really in some sense social. Well, actually, uh, part of the way I've been thinking about this lately is actually something that Evan kind of got me onto. And then there's also been a recent paper that I really haven't read that carefully in Trends in Cognitive Science about the notion that human metacognition actually emerges from social interaction. Like we learn to be metacognitive. We learn aware, you know, the sense of being conscious actually uh, that that emerges from our very early interactions. And uh, one way of thinking about, for example, one thing that I'm very interested in is uh, what the Buddhists call reflexive awareness, which is said to be the feature or aspect of cognition that is, or of, a, of consciousness that is continuous between the ordinary state and the awakened state, according to traditions like Mahmudra and Dzogchen. And so, uh, one way of thinking, I mean, you know, what's that kind of, and the claim is we always have that kind of knowing, actually, even while we're focused on an object, there's a sort of a sense of the background of our uh, a sense of being embodied, of our sense of being located in time and space that is presented along with us. And also just that very simple sense of being conscious, of feeling conscious. And, you know, how do you, is it that you constantly have, if I say to you, are you conscious right now? Do you have to go, wait a sec, let me look in, see if I'm <laughs> conscious. And then, and, but no, it's like, it just feels conscious. But, and you, it's, you know, and talk about certainty, it's got a certain indubitability to it, doesn't it? But it's not about, you know, kind of effortfully knowing, it's as if it's presented with whatever you are knowing now. So in that sense, it's not presented as an object, it's presented as, in a sense, non-dually, right? So what would that be, if you just think in evolutionary terms, what the heck would that be good for? Well, it might be exactly good for the kind of thing that Hanna is talking about, which is, you know, and then Durkheim and so on. It's like a collective, you know, if, we're, if we really can do, which is the claim that we have this capacity for a very high level capacity for cooperative cognition, a kind of collaborative cognition where we can, uh, you know, uh, literally link both conceptually, but even physiologically with other humans and, and engage in incredibly complex cooperative tasks that even while we're focused on the task, in a sense, we have to have an awareness of the group as well. And what would enable us, what would be a good kind of, you know, a cognitive feature would be something that would enable you to do that, which is exactly this kind of reflexivity. So that's kind of where my thinking has been going lately that, you know, in, in, in some sense, being, you know, embodied social beings, uh, what really brings us to, a, to that next level is precisely that sort of, that sort of awareness, reflexivity, that, no, that also means we're homo homo sapiens, right? That we know, we know ourselves as sapiens, but that it's almost like on this account, I'm not saying I'm endorsing it, but when you think of it in evolutionary terms, it's almost like a sort of side effect of being really good at, at uh, social cognition. Thank you, John. Adam notes in the chat, no brains in vats, and Evan responds, no brain is an island. 
So very related ideas. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we're reserving enough time uh, before this session comes to a close for the closing comments from both Roshi and Amy. But before we do that, since we have been talking about uh, ideas of science as a workshop and uh, uh, aware that in many ways this Varela Symposium and much of what uh, Mind and Life Europe has been doing uh, lately uh, has been in the service of providing these kinds of opportunities for uh, unusual interactions between scientists, philosophers, and, and others. Uh, so I'm noting that Gabor, uh, uh, I don't see his video, but uh, uh, his little window is there. And Gabor, whether in your new role within uh, Mind and Life Europe, uh, you'd like to say anything. Thank you, Al. It's been a fascinating uh, two or three days, actually. I was following all the discussions, all the dialogues, and uh, yesterday there was a moment when I thought it would be nice to bring uh, Levinas into the discussion. We were talking about uh, the self and the other in different contexts. Uh, Evan beautifully elaborated the notion of the other and then Hannah today as well in a specific way. So I just uh, saw that I would bring uh, Levinas beautiful wisdom here because it includes notions like uh, love and wisdom and uh, ethics and ontology, philosophy in a very specific way. So I consider Levinas as a philosopher who based his thinking on ethics rather than concept, uh, the ethics of the other uh, and ethics as first philosophy. The other is not knowable we were talking about knowledge and knowing and loving today. For him, the other is not knowable and cannot be made into an object of the self, as is done by traditional metaphysics, which Levinas called ontology. Um, and he also thinks of philosophy as uh, the wisdom of love rather than the love of wisdom. The usual translation of Greek uh, philosophia uh, so in this sense, uh, responsibility toward the other precedes any objective search after truth. Mm. So we live in this primordial ethical relationship and responsibility and responsiveness to the other that uh, transcends any knowable or any knowledge that we aspire for. So he derives the primacy of the ethics from the experience of the encounter with the other. And this is an irreducible relation. It's an epiphany. It's a face-to-face -face encounter. So that's what I experienced in this particular meeting, in this discussion, and this, in, this, in this dialogue with you all. Uh, this face-to-face uh, -face encounter in the community of you all, this beautiful group of thinkers and practitioners. Uh, although we were not able to face each other face to face, but we were here with our faces and uh, could probably find the time between us that mm -hmm. Hannah was referring to. Thank you, Gabor. Yeah, as you point out, what we're about is deeply and fundamentally ethical. So Roshi and Amy, we're turning it over to you for both the final and the wisest words. <laughs> well, for my part, I think that I would like to leave them to Gabor's words, his beautiful speaking about Levinas. Huh? Thank you very much for that, Gabor. It was really wonderful. Yeah. And could you post the Levinas uh, reference if you have it into the Q&A stream? Uh, one of the participants is requesting that. There's actually also a beautiful 
text by Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher that was written for um, Levinas. In fact, it's a mourning text. It's a grieving text for Levinas, where he speaks um, quite a bit about this notion that I brought in, um, but didn't want to elaborate from a Derridian sense in the Derridian direction of the idea of welcoming of the other and what it actually means to receive or to welcome the other face to face. Um, so that's a that's a great text as well. It's called Adieu. Mm, wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Roshi. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I often cite this incident uh, in these meetings, and uh, it seems appropriate at the end um, to uh, recall this encounter that I witnessed many decades ago between Jonas Salk, the developer of the polio vaccine, and Gregory Bateson. And Gregory, um, in a way, like Evan, Evan, you you are have some uh, definite similarities uh, to to Gregory. Um, Gregory was always setting traps for those he was interacting with, and it wasn't out of uh, spite or meanness. It was really out of this love of emergence, love of surprise, and also this kind of uh, spirit of transmission that uh, Gregory uh, uh, always emanated in his teachings. He taught really uh, through stories. And so this is a story. So Gregory uh, looks at Jonas Salk and he says, um, Jonas, where's the mind? And uh, Jonas put his hand to his temple, pointing to the brain and uh, Gregory, uh, just laughed, and he pointed between him and Jonas. And for me, it was, uh, you know, one of those social interactions, um, which was so revelatory. And what I was saying earlier about uh, the search for certainty, I think the search for certainty is a way that the self is reified. And Francisco uh, has said about the self that it's not a stable, it's not a, a solid entity. As Gregory made uh, the point clearly to Jonas, it's not within the head. Um, and then uh, Francisco wrote, uh, it's in a figure of multiple levels of emergence and is always fragile and constantly updating or renewing itself as it is submitted to all kinds of changes, both endogenous and exogenous. So we could, uh, by the words that Francisco is uh, articulating here in relation to the self, we could also say this in relation to society, um, that um, society is constantly updating itself in relation to uh, multiple encounters uh, with uh, contexts of difference. So I, I wanna thank uh, Gabor from the bottom of my heart for uh, stepping into uh, this process, into this metalogue. Um, Evan, I thank you uh, for our, our decades of friendship as we have uh, tangled through uh, the mind jazz of Lindisfarne uh, and Mind and Life, and uh, now the Varela Symposium, and Amy for uh, bringing um, your, uh, just the way that you manifest wisdom and love, and uh, also courage. And one of the qualities that uh, Amy uh, has manifested in um, uh, our, our friendship and also in mind and life is there is a kind of gentle persistence of showing up, of riding the waves of birth and death, mm -hmm. of um, not uh, feeling uh, threatened by emergence, but actually turning toward uh, the unknowable with incredible curiosity. 
And dear Richie, uh, we met in 92 in Dharamsala and um, I have learned so much from you. I'm so grateful that uh, in spite of the fact that you're this, you know, super busy guy, that what is happening is practice is overtaking science in your life for, for the benefit of all. And um, Adam, uh, Ev magnetized you into uh, our gaggle, into our karas. And um, your, your mind is an emergent mind um, in relation to the uh, players in this mandala. And it's always a joy. And Hannah and Elena, your profound contributions to see uh, women of such depth of looking, uh, depth of knowing and depth of loving, uh, bringing your wisdom into this time that we're sharing uh, is really, uh, I'm so deeply honored, uh, really on behalf of all of us. And I think my question is, since we've been, you know, in, the, in this uh, process of uncertainty, playing uh, together, you know, what will emerge in terms of uh, our futures, individual and collective? And uh, thank you so much, everyone. I wanna thank again, Tom and Nancy Driscoll. I wanna thank the translators with uh, all my heart. <laughs> and really yeah. un un an unbelievable feat of heart, mind and body. And um, also uh, Noah, uh, Joanne, and those in the background uh, of our various institutions who are, uh, in a certain way, the, the really essential parts of uh, making all of this possible. Thank you. And Roshi, thanks to you, you remain the inspiration, the wind in the sails of not just this symposium, but so many other things that Upaya has set in motion. So I think um, we have reached uh, a temporary closure. <laughs> so to speak, if there is such a thing. But I hope we will carry forth um, this, the great work of Francisco as uh, a kind of platform for our own development as individuals and as friends. To friendship. Thank to you. friendship, dear. Thank you here. Dear John. Yeah. Our, our, yeah, sorry, John, I didn't mention you in the, mention you in the long lineup. <laughs> I'm used Don't to worry. It. Don't take it personally. <laughs> John, you loom so the Self large. is fragile. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just practice collective decentering. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thanks to Al, too. Actually, wonderful yeah. job, Al. Thank you. So uh, much. Thank you, John. Beautiful. Thank you. We'll see you all around, but hopefully also next year. Next yes. Year. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Thanks to all the yeah. participants. Thank bye. you, Roshi. Thank you all. Bye. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. Like a blast. Goodbye. <laughs> sad now. No, I'm sad.